Can you know that God is there? How would you know? What evidence would suffice? If an alleged experience of God inspires one to live a better life, is that reason enough to conclude that the experience is indeed of God? What best explains claims of religious experiences? That these are actual experiences caused by God? Or encounters with God? Or that these religious experiences arise from people's minds? Do disagreements among religious believers concerning the nature of their claims to religious experience cast doubt on the trustworthiness of those experiences? Is faith just something that religious folk have? Reflect on our study of epistemology and recall that we concluded with the question of whether it can be known that there are or are not spiritual beings. We listened to Schubert's musical interpretation of Goethe's poem based on the folklore concerning the Erlkönig, or the Earl King. Now recall that the Earl King was a spirit-like, elf-like creature who liked to come steal children, luring them over into his realm. Also remember that to enter the spirit realm, which is by definition not material, requires leaving the material behind. And so Goethe tells the story of a father swiftly riding on horseback through the woods one night as his son lies sick and suffering in his arms. As the father rides swiftly through the woods, the boy sees the Earl King, and the Earl King is singing sweetly to him, trying to get him to come play and come see his daughters and let the Earl King take care of him. The boy is scared, and he cries out, and the father keeps saying, No, you're seeing things. There's nothing there. That's just the wind, or that's just the leaves being moved by the wind. That's just a shadow in the trees. Finally, the Earl King tires of playing nice, and he says, If you won't come with me, then I'll take you by force. The boy screams out, My father, the Earl King has me and has done me harm. When the father finally arrives home, he looks down only to find his lifeless child in his arm. Now, what's so good about this story in a very imaginative and romantic way is the open question. We have the whole story and yet we have no more information than when we started because both sides of the story can make sense. It makes sense from the empiricist point of view to say as the father did that the boy was just hallucinating with a high fever and seeing things and spirit realms don't exist and Certainly, he hasn't been taken to the spirit realm because here is his body. Yet, it also makes sense to reason that bodies, material bodies, cannot enter into the spirit realm. So, if the boy did go, he left the body behind. And the boy was certain of what he was experiencing. He cried out in the moment saying that he was taken and here he is dead. If there is an Earl King and the Earl King did take the child, the body would still be left behind. Everything would have still happened as it did, and so we can't really know that there is no Earl King. We can neither prove the father's empirical point that there is no Earl King, nor the boy's existential, pragmatic claim that there is, that he knows for a fact because he has experienced it. Note that both perspectives have to take their conclusions on faith. Today we're going to dig away at the grounding for faith and the question of faith's relationship to reason. I will first review three basic paradigms for approaching the question of faith. Then I will make some clarifications as it relates to reason and faith. And since faith is a term misrepresented by many non-believers and even misunderstood by many believers, I will submit to you a proper working definition. Finally, since next week we begin to build our apologetic case for theism, I will briefly overview the nature and considerations of religious apologetics, broadly speaking. 
So we're first going to look at the epistemic nature of faith, that is, faith as a means of knowing or acquiring knowledge. Now, because religious experience is an experience, we have a unique situation in which we have both the objective and the subjective intertwined. We're not simply making statements about what is out there, although we are when we say God exists. There's also the subjective element, I have experienced God, and that complicates questions of justified knowing. So here we have to be careful and make a distinction when it comes to justification. We need to consider epistemic justifications for our religious beliefs, and this involves reasons for belief or rationalized propositions. Yet we also need to consider pragmatic justifications. And this may involve not only what seems to be confirmed to the believer within a subjective experience or encounter, if you will, but also practical advantages of a religious belief, even where rationalized arguments may be lacking. In other words, it's possible that someone has no knowledge of how to even begin going about building a logical case for the existence of God. They've never thought about that before, and yet they have thought about whether or not there is an afterlife and whether or not they ought to be living a certain way. And they might have reasoned in a pragmatic way that whether or not there is a God, whether or not they could prove that, it certainly would seem to be in their best advantage to live as if God is there and live a life as if they would give an account to a creator. In this sense, we have a sort of pragmatic justification. They haven't given a rational defense of God's existence, but they have at least reasoned that it would seem to work in their best interest that is their eternal interest to believe in God. Now last time we looked at criticisms of metaphysics in general and religion in particular. Now we are going to adopt the perspective of the believer and try to dig at the nature of grounding faith for a religious believer. Yet we will also discover that faith is an issue for the non-believer as well. So faith is a much deeper issue than you may have thought. So let's begin with an overview of three basic paradigms or approaches to the nature of faith. If you believe that reason and intellect are not as important as experience, you are an experientialist. This is a form of subjectivism. Religious truth is based upon personal testimony. The problems or cons with this perspective are that it is not verifiable and it is unhelpful because all religions offer personal testimonies. So how is one to distinguish between these different claims? The basic justification or argument, if we were to draw that out for them, would be God seems to be sensed. The best explanation is that he is sensed Therefore, God exists, or probably exists. Few people would contest premise one. I can't tell you whether or not you think you experience God, whether or not he seems to be sensed to you. I, I don't have access to your subjectivity. However, premise two and the conclusion are questionable. If your claim is, well, I have a feeling, or as some say, I have a burning in my bosom that tells me this is true, the critic might ask, well, how do you know that's not just heartburn? So it's not really going to be convincing. This is a form of non-evidentialism. Non-evidentialism is the view that it is not rationally required to have objective, rational evidence for our basic beliefs or worldview. Now, existentialists like Nietzsche and Sartre fall into this camp because they assert that there is no way it should be in the world, that life is meaningless, but then they take a leap of faith that it can or will become meaningful if you declare your own truths in the world and declare for yourself your own essence and identity. Now, 
if there is no meaning to the world, then at the end of the day you can do whatever you want, but why think that the world will then go better because everyone asserts what they want for themselves? The existentialists especially run into problems in the 20th century when people like Sartre and uh, Simone de Beauvoir are caught up in politics and seeking political justice and they're asserting things like what is right and how we should live, but shouldness and rightness and justice and the way things are supposed to be doesn't fit on the existentialist rejection that there is a way things should be. And so like the religious believer who says, well, I had an experience, I felt it in my chest, I know God is real, and so you should believe in him too. So too the existentialist is saying, well, my experience tells me that there's no meaning and that we can assert our own identities and meaning onto the world. And now that we are advancing in that way, my experience tells me that these things are meaningful and that we should advocate for these rights or these truths. So come help me. Come join the cause. Both positions, religious or non-religious, are advancing a prescription of what others ought to believe that is based solely upon the subjective interpretation of experience and meaning in life. They are both leaps of faith. And indeed, existentialism began within theology and was tied to the idea of a leap of faith. And it quickly influenced atheology, and we see the same sort of leap of faith happening there. But for many of you, perhaps this is simply unacceptable. If you believe that there is sufficient evidence for God, and we are to reason logically about religious truths or our claims to religious knowledge, then you are an evidentialist. Theistic evidentialism often includes natural theology. While it may involve intuition, in the same way that science appeals to an intuition of mathematics, this approach appeals not to subjective experience, but to reason and common sense based on both rational intuitions and objective facts that lie within the objectivity of our experiences in the natural world beyond our subjective interpretations. Classical theistic apologetics falls into this category. When I say classical apologetics, I am referencing the philosophical theology in the Middle Ages and the Age of Reason, which argued that religious propositions can be verified just like scientific propositions. And contrary to the notion that it was a dark intellectual age, the Middle Ages produced many scholars and philosophers who were interested in the questions of theology as well as science. Hildegard of Bingen, for instance, a Renaissance woman long before the Renaissance, was interested in science and medicine and music. She is a significant and celebrated composer in the Western music heritage. And contrary to the idea of seeing faith as something antithetical to reason, on Bingen's view, which reflected the consensus among many, faith and reason are complementary. Reason can expand faith, and faith can enhance intelligibility and understanding. For Hildegard, all of the cosmos is like music. It all makes harmonic sense. Every element has a sound, an original sound from the order of God. All those sounds unite like the harmony of harps and zithers. Thus, belief in God is quite reasonable. Ibn Rushd, sometimes called Averos, for example, was a medieval Islamic philosopher who shows up, by the way, in Raphael's School of Athens and is famous for having introduced Aristotle back to the West. His commentaries on the works of Aristotle were translated into Latin and then introduced back into the Christian West in the mid-1200s. He argued, God would never give us reason, then give us divine laws that contradict such reason. At a time in which many people believed there to be great conflict between pagan philosophy and religious tradition and theology, the medieval Jewish philosopher Maimonides advocated for the complementary nature of faith and reason of Greek pagan philosophy and religious tradition. He admired Aristotle's logic, 
but expanded Aristotle's arguments, and he insisted that we ought never to choose a teaching based on its origins, but based by its truthfulness. These two philosophers had great influence on many thinkers thereafter as it relates to the significant role that reason plays in theology. But it was the Summa Theologica of the Christian philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas that really stands out when it comes to apologetics. Now that Aristotle's works had been reintroduced to the West, there was a new wave of Aristotelian thought within the Christian tradition. Using as foundation Aristotelian logic, Aquinas developed several rationalist proofs for the existence of God, including the argument from motion, an argument from efficient cause, an argument from possibility and necessity, an argument from the gradation of being, and an argument from design. So, evidentialism has a rich heritage in Western thought. The drawback or con of this perspective is that the intellectual can become dry and removed from the experiential. So, the experientialist has a drawback of rationality, and yet they might be able to communicate more effectively with someone who is interested in experiencing God, not just rationalizing God's existence. The intellectual nature of evidentialism will appeal more to the one who is seeking the rational grounding for God's existence, whether or not they sense that they are feeling God's presence meaningfully in their immediate life. Perhaps they reason that there is no reason to expect deep and awesome experiences here in the now, but that if they get the God question correct, then meaningful experiences will follow later in eternity. Of course, if an evidentialist is speaking to one who is desperate to feel or experience God in their immediate circumstance, then building rational proofs for God's existence probably isn't going to go very far. Many atheists fall into this camp. Many atheists are evidentialists insofar as they believe that if there is a God, then this sort of truth should be demonstrable, or even obvious. Recall logical positivism and the principle of verifiability. If it can't be obviously proven empirically or through logical rational proofs, then you can't say that it's meaningful, so God can't exist. This is an evidentialist approach to belief. Finally, if you believe that evidence is meaningless to the non-believer, because faith must come first, then you are a presuppositionalist. Now, there are two camps of presuppositionalism. There is a faith-first camp, which means that only once you believe can you begin to understand. In other words, before you can understand a worldview, you have to try it on. So, too, on this belief, sometimes you have to adopt the perspective or adopt the belief before you are able to make rational sense of it all. Augustine of Hippo, or St. Augustine, in many areas, in many ways, stressed a presuppositional sort of understanding. Yet he also appealed to logic and experience and beauty and morality and built arguments against the problem of evil, etc. So this approach does not advocate just leaving your mind at the door and just taking the leap of blind faith. Rather, it says that before you can really begin to dig into understanding, you have to commit yourself to a willingness to first believe. It's really hard to understand the Christian doctrine of the Trinity unless you try on the Christian worldview and try to understand uh, the things that are in place in order to arrive at the theology of the Trinity. It's difficult for many atheists to understand the problem of evil because they first see the evil and then see God's goodness and justice in question, whereas the theist may first see God's justice and due respect and a world not as it should be because it's in rebellion to God. And therefore, God would be just 
in ending evil, which would mean wiping everyone out. And so God is extending goodness or love by not doing that or waiting and giving people more time to uh, change their ways or whatever. Other theists might see God's love first. If you see God as a loving parent invested in us as children, if he has all knowledge of future events and loves us and wants what's best for us, then you might first see that God has reasons not for causing all suffering in the world, but for allowing things to happen because we know from our own experiences that many times once we have gone through something painful as it was, we come out the other side stronger, more resilient, and sometimes even if it was bittersweet, we come out a better person. So the problem of evil is really a great example of how what you presuppose when you first approach an issue kind of guides the way that you think about the issue. Which is why the faith first presuppositionalist might say, well try it on. Assume for the moment that God is all just and all knowing and all loving and wants what's best for us. What would then follow? The Protestant reformer John Calvin also approached this faith first presuppositionalism, but he did so in a different way. The Christian scriptures teach that uh, our understanding has been darkened because of the effects of sin or our separation from God, and thus sin has depraved us of many things, including our ability to rationalize. If that's the case, then it would make sense that we can't understand something to start with. We would have to first open ourselves up to the possibility and try to take a step of faith and then allow God's light of truth to remove the darkness from our mind. Again, this makes sense. If you think about the way light and shadows work, you bring a light to the darkness, the shadow moves. So if our mind is darkened and we're separated from God, then if we take the step to believe in God and God is moving closer to us and we are moving closer to God, then the light removes the darkness. So this is a faith-first presuppositionalism, and as you can see, it's quite deep. In many ways, it's a worldview theology or a worldview apologetics because you have to start by reevaluating the way that you see things. But it does suggest that only the believers can fully understand and unbelievers are blinded. The second camp stresses this full force. It is not faith first, but faith alone. Now this camp called fideism, and you'll see the word fide like bona fide or bona fide, the good faith, fideism, carrying faith to the extreme. A faith alone presuppositionalism asserts that religious belief must be based on faith alone. Now usually this is because sees faith as antithetical to reason, that when you try to rationalize things about God, you are using your sinful nature, and God just wants your love, your leap of faith. He wants your heart. The rebellious nature says, I have to rationalize everything. I refuse to believe it or buy into it until I can understand it. Whereas the one who loves God Whereas the faithful or the righteous says, I don't understand it, but I give my heart to God. Now, in one sense, we can admire where the fideist is coming from. They are really sincere about giving their all to God, giving their best to God, and not allowing any rational uncertainties to hinder their ardent expression of love and praise for God. However, this camp has some problems. We saw with the faith first presuppositionalism that you don't have to be closed minded to be a presuppositionalist. The fideist is more of the leave your mind at the door, it's all heart from here approach. This is the most closed minded view on the nature of faith. It is anti reason. Reason is even treated with suspicion. However, there's a problem. If we were created with rational minds, and if faith is contrary to reason, then a refusal to believe the irrational would separate us from God. 
But wouldn't this suggest that we were purposefully created with a hindrance to our salvation? If faith is antithetical to reason, and we naturally reason, then when we reason about God to evaluate whether or not the arguments are good or bad, especially if this involves the image of God and we are acting like God when we use our mind, since God is a mind, then did not God give us something that keeps us from Him? If it is our nature to rationalize? The Christian fideist has a further problem because when asked what the greatest commandment in all the law was, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. So the Christian fideist has to explain what Jesus meant there. Of course, to do this, they would have to rationalize their explanation, which would be counterproductive to their cause. Now let's look at some case studies. The first two are somewhere between experience-based and presuppositional, and the latter is a hybrid of the presuppositional and the evidential. Soren Kierkegaard is considered the father of existentialism, and indeed he took an existential leap to presupposition. He argued that faith is a paradox. It's contrary to what seems rational, thus it requires a lunge into darkness, a leap of faith. Now, he was facing several issues of his day. Not only was he dealing with questions of life's meaning, but he was also fighting against certain theological issues. The Danish church, along with others, practiced infant baptism. Now, this meant that whenever uh, one was born, they were automatically baptized. It was part of the, the culture of the society at large. Now, this means that what you get is everyone baptized, so everyone, the entire culture, is nominally or by name a Christian. Automatically a Christian without any kind of conversion or any need for commitment. And to Kierkegaard, this simply wouldn't work. Some act of sincerity is necessary for faith. He was also pondering the fact that God is transcendent and can only be approached by the heart. Proof doesn't work because truth is bigger than our ability to reason or comprehend. God is understandably beyond comprehension. When we attempt to rationalize, we're attempting to put all that is unknown within our comprehension. So this wouldn't work either. One can only find certainty, when it comes to God, within the subjective experience of God. Now, as you recall from our study in existentialism, a key component is absurdity. And indeed, we look around here trying to find meaning in everything but God, and we cannot, ultimately, because everything down here is ultimately absurd. But this absurdity leads us to take the only real leap toward any true sense of meaning. And yet, it defies rationality. But therein, within the leap, one finds true understanding and discovers authentic identity. Just as Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, not to actually do so, and not to prove anything to God, but to see for himself and to serve as an example to others that great faith is a trust in God that takes a leap beyond the rational. For Abraham trusted that if God is God, then he is able to bring back his son, even if Abraham were to go through with it. Moreover, this was the son that had been promised to Abraham the child through whom Abraham's descendants would become like countless grains of sand. Without understanding why he was being asked to do this task, yet trusting that God's commands and promises are not arbitrary and that God would be able to deliver upon his promise, Abraham trusted that whatever he is being asked to do now and for whatever reason, this is nevertheless the son whom God had promised the one through whom Abraham would become a father of many nations. And so Abraham took a leap of faith, of trust, 
which defied reason and understanding, and through which God was able to demonstrate to Abraham his faithfulness to provide. So too, Kierkegaard says, many things escape rationalizability and defy reason, but we take a leap of faith into God, and there we will find the meaning and identity and hope for which we search. Next we have Blaise Pascal. Pascal sees faith as above reason, but not contrary to reason. Whatever you have will be lost when you die. The new science of the day, astronomy, reveals just how little we know. So why should we trust our earthly wisdom, you might say? Moreover, faith is like a wager. You don't have a choice. You must wager. So in the long run, you choose, even if by default. You can plea agnosticism now, but not indefinitely. You have between now and the time you die to make your choice. When you die, if you have failed to choose, then you have made your choice. Pascal's view on faith is an interesting case study. Faith itself is presuppositional, but the wager that gets you there is logical and evidential. You reason about pros and cons and probability. Suppose you have children, if you don't, and suppose you hear reports that your house is on fire and your children are inside. Now you may not know for sure whether your children are inside. You may not know for sure whether your house is on fire. You don't even know whether these reports are reliable. What is the reasonable thing to do? Is it more reasonable to just ignore them or to hurry home and see? Now this isn't the best example because when you get home you can see, but in the moment that you choose whether or not to continue working or not, there you have to make a choice and there you are wagering. You can either say, well my house never gets on fire and my children are always safe, they always know what to do. If a fire did start, they wouldn't be stuck. They're smart kids, they would find a way out. Or do you say, I need to get there and, and see? Not knowing for sure. Let's go a step further. Let's say that the people who gave you these reports lie sometimes. And they've told you false things before. However, this is more personal. This is directly related to something you cherish. What will you do? Well, for Pascal, the choice of whether or not to believe in God is a lot like this. It is something that has the potential for affecting you deeply, personally, and eternally. So he says, let's just look at the wager. Either there is a God or not. And if there is no God, and I live however I want, well, if there's no God, there's no life beyond this life. So I spent the entirety of my existence doing what I want. I had a lot of gain and happiness in the now, but then I died and I would never know how happy I was anyway. So it was a momentary gain. On the other hand, if there is no God and I live like there is, I will not do whatever I want, but I will live within restriction, supposing that I have to answer to God later. Well, in that case, I did not get to do everything I might possibly want to do in this life. But if there's no God, at the end of it, I die, and I'm not here to ponder how I should have done differently. So perhaps there was a little loss, but it was minimal. On the other hand, if God does exist, and I live as though he exists, well, I have minimal loss in the now, but I have a maximal gain insofar as we're speaking of eternity. But if God exists and I live as if he doesn't, then I get to do whatever I want now in a finite period of time, but then in light of eternity, I lose. So Pascal's wager is to weigh the pros and cons here. If I choose 
to live as though God does not exist. I choose to not believe in God. Well, in that case, if God does exist, I had a minimal temporary gain and a maximal long-term loss. On the other hand, if I choose to believe in God and live as though I am accountable to Him, I may, or may not, I may have a momentary, temporary, minimal loss in the now, but I have a maximum long-term gain in eternity. So, mathematician, as Pascal was, he says, is clearly in our better interest to choose to have faith even where reason may be lacking because it makes the most sense speaking probabilistically in terms of the wager. Pascal also stressed the idea that imagination can be stronger than reason. The heart or the cardia, that is the self or core part of a person, has reasons which the mind knows not. So reason, though useful, he's a mathematician, he just used reason to rationalize the wager. Reason is useful, but it depends upon the heart and the intuition for its first principles or its properly basic beliefs. Reason is useful, but it's imperfect. Reason is somewhat necessary. We use it all the time in navigating the law of non-contradiction. Yet the heart, with its keen sense of intuition, serves as reasons, or objective proofs, balancing tool. Now notice that there is a sort of pragmatic approach here. We are faced with certain questions about what is rational or reasonable uh, concerning objective proofs, but our heart as a sort of tempering tool evaluates whether or not these rationalist proofs cohere or work with our deep-seated intuitions. He also spoke of the heart as a heart-shaped vacuum, if you've ever heard that idea. We all have a void that we're trying to fill up, and this is because we are seeking the God from whom we are separated. He writes, The heart has its reasons, which reason does not know. We feel it in a thousand things. It is the heart which experiences God, and not the reason. This, then, is faith. So perhaps we can rationalize our basis for belief upon the wager, yet ultimately God is known through the heart's experiencing Him, even through the heart's experiencing its longing that nothing can fulfill. In the words of C.S. Lewis, if I experience within myself a desire which nothing in this world can satisfy, the most likely explanation is that I was made for another world. Peter Kreeft has neatly summarized Pascal's argument. If God does not exist, it does not matter how you wager, for there is nothing to win after death and nothing to lose after death, but if God exists, your only chance of winning eternal happiness is to believe, and your only chance of losing is to refuse to believe. As Pascal says, I should be more afraid of being mistaken and then finding out that Christianity is true than of being mistaken in believing it to be true. If you believe too much, you neither win nor lose eternal happiness. But if you believe too little, you risk losing everything. Now, there is some wisdom within this quasi-pragmatic approach. But what if God specifically punishes or ignores those who believe in Him for self-serving reasons? What if He favors honest doubters who use their God-given reasoning to honor Him with all their mind by believing in Him based on evidence? Or what if nothing we do really matters because people are already predetermined or predestined for heaven or hell? What if God made a lot of people, but he only really cares about some. The fact of equality or egalitarianism does not necessarily follow from theism, unless we've good reason to believe that God created us equally and is invested in all of us. In this case, would Pascal's wager work? 
Or what if God hates gambling, as some people might believe? What if Pascal has the wrong God, since we've no evidence for choosing one over another? Or what if God is not good, and enjoys sending all people, believer and non-believer alike, to eternal torture or punishment? There are certainly many strengths to Pascal's view, but he does not necessarily escape all criticism. So for Kierkegaard, we take the existential leap to faith as presupposition. For Pascal, faith is presupposition, but it's based upon a logical and evidential wager. Next, we have a hybrid approach that combines evidence and experience and presupposition. Perhaps the effective nature of this combination approach is why these two authors are considered by many to offer some of the most effective defenses of the theistic view. C.S. Lewis, quite renowned for his Chronicles of Narnia, and Francis Schaeffer were 20th century Christian apologists that argued from both experience and evidence. One striking variable about the approach of these philosophers is that they both saw a significant role that the arts play in conveying meaning to us and um, sort of being used by us as an existential um, launch pad into either theological dialogue or uh, expression of our angst or theological frustrations. Many art objects raise the question, what is the world like? Or assert the question, why is the world like it is? Or perhaps even assert, there is beauty in the world, like this. Here you go. While Lewis is more widely known, Schaeffer's approach was quite profound and might be described as a polemic evidentialism with a presuppositionalist methodology. So apologetics is when you are building the defense. Polemics is when you are building your critique or launching your attack. So Schaefer's approach in methodology was to start with presuppositionalism, but not presupposing his own view, but presupposing your view or another view. So we start by testing the veracity of the opposing view. He called this taking the roof off. You take the roof off of the house, which is the worldview, in order to see if the foundation, the justifications, and the walls, the different ideas that are asserted or the arguments, are strong enough to support the roof, the conclusion of the worldview. If not, we have to rethink the whole construction of the house. So we start by testing the veracity of the opposing view, and then we use this, our conclusion from that exploration, as a dialogical bridge, a bridge to open the dialogue, and then to apply the same standard of veracity to the presuppositions of our own view. So after exposing that view as problematic, then we can look at our view and say, well, does this view, or, or maybe not ours, but another, does this view better solve that problem? So on this perspective, faith is not a blind leap. It is a choice that comes from reason and dialectic. And this is accomplished by presupposing the view that we're going to critique in order to see if all the conclusions fit, and then presupposing a contrary view to see if the conclusions fit better within that perspective. One example of this, and I might offend some people here, is critical theory. So critical theory asserts many things about justice and human rights. However, critical theory grew out of Marxism, which is a dialectical materialism. And materialism says there is nothing beyond the physical world, which is why many materialists have historically followed this to its logical conclusion and said, for example, as did Jeremy Bentham, that when we talk of human rights, this is just nonsense on stilts. It doesn't make sense. So we could uh, presuppose the entire worldview of the critical theorist 
that justice is meaningful, that we care about human rights, but that also that materialism best describes the nature of reality. And then we try to think as a materialist. This is what Berkeley did with empiricism. Okay, if I'm going to be the best materialist I can, then let's get rid of all the immaterialist stuff. So justice, well, how am I going to ground that? I can point to things, but I can't really say that they're just because justice doesn't make sense. Uh, they can have their view of justice, and this group can have their view of justice, but I can't really say that one group is better unless I point to something beyond the group. But that doesn't work. That's not materialist. Human rights. Well, I can't really pull that out. As Hobbes said, Thomas Hobbes of the in early Enlightenment, who was a materialist, um, in the state of nature, you know, we have a right to whatever we have the power to take, including one another's body. If there are no laws except for the laws of nature, as it has been said, nature is red in tooth and claw. There is no perspective beyond to get this idea of ethics. And there's more to be said about this, but we don't have time to go into it here. The point is, we can take a view like that, that has a lot to say about human rights and justice, yet is typically traditionally founded within a perspective of materialism, and we can presuppose that materialism in order to say, uh-oh, some of these things don't work. One of these things is not like the other. You say justice, you say human rights, okay, well, that makes sense if I'm thinking as an immaterialist. But then you say materialism. That doesn't work. So having taken the roof off of critical theory, we're able to expose that the ideals, which may be good, don't follow from the foundations. And then we can pick any given theistic worldview and uh, take the roof off of that. At this point, we are presupposing that worldview. Let's think as theists, and specifically as this sort of theist in order to see if we can get closer to the ideals which we are so convinced, by intuition, by the way, that they exist. So this is a really powerful approach. As a Christian, Schaefer insisted that much of what we understand, especially as it relates to things like right and wrong, goodness, justice, and beauty, involves a presuppositionally biblical framework. In other words, when you talk about justice and human rights, you're the one presupposing a Christian worldview. He pressed the point that even if we deny God, he is still there. We live in his world, and we still function as we were designed. He called this the mannishness of man, which meant our deep knowledge often shows itself as we smuggle in our intuitive awareness of God's truth into our belief system. We cannot help, in other words, but be the beings that we were created to be. Schaefer stated, The truth that we let in first is not the dogmatic statement of truth of the scriptures, but the truth of the external world and the truth of what man himself is. This is what shows him his need. The scriptures then show him the real nature of his loneliness and the answer to it. He also disagreed with the approach of many Christians when they evangelize. And if you're a non-theist or a non-Christian, perhaps you can identify with where he's coming from. It's common for Christians to approach evangelism by trying to go straight to the cross of Jesus and the need for one to believe in Jesus in order for salvation. In contrast to this approach, Schaefer said, We must never forget that the first part of the gospel of Christ is not accept Christ as Savior, but God is there. Only then is one ready to hear of God's solution for man's moral dilemma. So while he adopted a presuppositionalist methodology, he actually spoke against the general nature of presupposition. The Christian presupposes that the person that they're speaking to when they evangelize already understands sin and their need for salvation and that God is there. But why presuppose that everyone already understands this? For the non-believer, 
Schaefer liked to press the point that one may say God does not exist in theory, but then they reveal something very different when they live out their life. And when it comes to morality and convictions concerning justice or desire for meaningfulness and identity, Schaefer would say this searching for meaningfulness reflects a deep-seated awareness that it is there to be known, that deep within our presuppositions, we presuppose a theistic worldview. In the words of Christian philosopher and radio personality Greg Kokel, we say there is no ultimate purpose. We make our own rules. We create our own purposes. We live by our own creed. You do you. But then our words betray us when our guard is down. Our actions tell a different story, revealing deeper beliefs, tacit convictions that conflict with our man-made philosophies, accurate intuitions about reality we cannot deny even when we try. C.S. Lewis focused more on certain aspects of our subjective experience, specifically as it relates to intuition and very much upon evidence-based reasoning. Lewis's early mentor was a staunch atheist, and he really trained Lewis in the art of a rigorous deductive reasoning. He was the sort of fellow that if you were driving through the countryside and you said, I didn't expect it to be so beautiful today, he might lay into you and say, what do you mean you didn't expect it? What do you mean beautiful? What reason have you for not expecting it to be the way you expected it to be? What reason would you have had to expect it to be that way anyway? Can you give me an answer? If you cannot justify what you mean, then perhaps you had no business saying it in the first place. So from his mentor, he learned the art, power, and importance of good, strong, thorough, rational argumentation. And perhaps equally from his mentor's influence, although I know not that for certain, by the time Lewis was a teenager, he was a staunch atheist. However, from an early point in Lewis's life as a child, he was drawn to things like the beauty in nature and imagination and this idea of desire. And that bugged him throughout his life. And he was always drawn to the writings of romantics, many of whom were actually Christian thinkers, even though he was an atheist. He was really interested in the romantic approach to literature where the art and the writing brings to life a desire that you have deep within you and it's only momentary but it speaks to that desire and it enraptures you and you're like yes that's what I want I want more of that but then at the end of the art you're left sinking back into your dissatisfaction and Lewis's sensitivity to beauty and desire and ethical meaning, morality, these things which did not fit within his atheist worldview began to rub him the wrong way like a stone in his shoe. They eventually brought him to a point in which he said, these things don't fit. I've got to rethink the worldview. And he eventually became a theist. He was good friends with uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and others. And they would talk a lot about art and meaning and theology and through both his pragmatic convictions where his deep intuitions concerning beauty and desire and morality and through these recurrent dialogues with his Christian friends he eventually moved from atheism to theism and then at a later point he moved on from theism to Christian theism. In his renowned work Mere Christianity Lewis argued from logic and also appeal to intuitive experiences like evil and desire. So his general approach was through rational argument and appealing to evidence, but his evidences often involved and appealed to our deep-seated convictions, our pragmatic intuitions known through lived experience. One of Lewis's most famous quotes from Mere Christianity, referring to his presuppositions as an atheist, is, My argument against God, 
was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. So reason is important. You cannot believe what you know is untrue. You cannot love what you do not know. Even children get this. I'm going to brag on my daughter for a moment. My little five-year-old came up to me one day and she said, Papa, how can I love God if I've never seen him? Now, she was really focusing on the question of physical appearance. But the underlying question is the same. How can we love what we don't know? So sometimes love might sweep us off our feet, you know. It may have an irrational edge to it. But ultimately, we do not give our heart and time and allegiance to things unless it makes sense for us to do so. Yet we also see that there is something else involved here that is tethered to experience and not reason alone. This thing that we call faith does involve an action. And that action is significant. It's important. But how shall we define it? The feediest answer that it is antithetical to reason, that is unsatisfactory. The idea that it is a leap into the irrational, well, that kind of makes sense if we understand where Kierkegaard is coming from, but it is also unsatisfactory. Faith is not just a wishful thinking. It's not the same as wishing. It's not the same as hoping unless when you hope, you actually expect to get the thing you hope for. And it is certainly not pretending to know things that you don't know. So how shall we define it? I think the most satisfactory explanation I've heard comes from philosopher Tim McGrew, who specializes in epistemology and teaches at Western Michigan University. He points out that one does not have faith that chickens exist because nothing is ventured. You might believe that chickens exist, but you don't actually have a faith involved in that belief. However, when you jump from a plane wearing a parachute, and really regardless of your belief about parachutes, you are exercising a faith that the parachute is properly packed. So the act of one's faith is not the same as the object of one's faith. The act of believing is not the same as what you believe in. This means that the most appropriate definition of faith is conviction wagering action. So faith, as it turns out, is the sort of thing that is applied. Now this actually means that you cannot avoid having faith because however you apply your beliefs about the world, you are exercising your faith in your beliefs about the world. Now this means that atheists also have faith and agnostics who never make their choice at the end of the day also exercised faith. This was Pascal's point and this was the point that followed from William James's argument. If you choose to believe that there is no God, and then you live according to that belief, you have exercised faith, you have wagered an action, a lifestyle, based on your conviction. Note also that the strength of one's faith is not measured by sincerity, but by the object in which it is placed. It does not matter how sincere you are in your belief that the parachute is properly packed if, in fact, it is not properly packed and you plummet to your death. Now, there are two types of faith and a small bridge between them. Emotional faith is a feelings-based faith. I believe based on my subjective experience, the burning in my bosom, or however you might put it. Whereas an intellectual faith is a proposition-based faith. I believe according to the evidence I see or the convincing arguments I have pondered. And this might involve an appeal to natural revelation through the nature of the world 
or divine revelation through scripture or fulfilled prophecy or things like this. But is there ever a middle ground? Well, it depends. If one is certain that she has experienced God, then this may count as a properly basic belief, grounded within the context of experience until or unless some other experience runs contrary. Philosophers call beliefs like this properly basic beliefs. They aren't based on other beliefs. Rather, they're part of the foundation of a person's system of beliefs. Other properly basic beliefs would include belief in the existence of the external world, uh, the reality of the past, the presence of other minds besides your own. When you think about it, none of those beliefs can be proved. How can you prove, for example, that the world was not created five minutes ago with built-in appearances of age, memory traces in our brains from events that we never experienced, food in our stomachs from the dinners we never really ate? How can you prove that you're not a brain in a vat or a body lying in the matrix wired up with electrodes and tubes uh, by some mad scientist who makes you believe that you're here in this arena listening to this lecture? How can you prove that that person sitting next to you really has a mind rather than being a soulless android who just exhibits the external behavior of someone with an interior life? None of these things can really be proved. These are just properly basic beliefs which we have. Now, in saying that these beliefs are basic, that does not mean that they are arbitrary. Rather, they are grounded in the sense that they're formed in the context of having certain experiences of the world, in the experiential context of seeing and hearing and feeling certain things. I naturally form the belief that there is an external world of objects which I'm sensing. So my basic beliefs are not arbitrary. They're grounded in experience. There might not be any way to prove such beliefs, but it's perfectly rational to hold them. In fact, you'd have to be crazy to think that the world was created five minutes ago. You'd be mad if you really thought you were a brain in a vat. Such beliefs are therefore not merely basic, they're properly basic. Now, it is also possible that there may be a subjective exclusive quality of God's working within the believer that is able to become a sort of testimony a confirmation of sorts. Christianity, for example, speaks of a transformation of the mind and even to an extent of behavior, or at least the severity of the impulse towards certain behaviors, as God works within the believer. Now, Christianity speaks of God working within some believers to draw him to himself, but not necessarily working in this way. But we have to at least leave it out there as possibility if we are allowing that the existence of God is possible, then we have to allow that God can do whatever God wants. And if that's the case, then God could speak directly to individuals or use unique things within their life to bring them through subjective experiences to a point of rationalized conviction. Of course, if we allow that this is possible, this should nevertheless be expected as an exception and not the norm. Still, it is possible that some conviction comes only through experience. I read your book. Here we go. Would you like me to put you? Ironically, uh, the thing that people are most hungry for, meaning is the one thing that science hasn't been able to give them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. It's like you're saying that science killed God. What if, what if science simply revealed that he never existed in the first place? I think we're going to need to get some air. What? And a few more of these. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, a little chilly out here. Yeah, this is nice. I got one for you. What do you got? Occam's razor. You've ever heard of it? Oh, 
Occam's Razor. It sounds like some slasher movie. No, Occam's Razor. It's a basic scientific principle. And it says, all things being equal, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. Makes sense to me. All right. So what's more likely? Thank you. Like and an all-powerful, mysterious God created the universe and then decided not to give any proof of his existence. Or that he simply doesn't exist at all. And that we created him so we wouldn't have to feel so small and alone. I don't know. I couldn't imagine living in a world where God didn't exist. No. I wouldn't want to. How do you know you're not deluding yourself? I mean, for me, I, I'd need proof. Proof. Did you love your father? What? Your dad, did you love him? Yes, very much. Prove it. There's no direct evidence, no. Tell me something, doctor. Why do you think these aliens would go to all this trouble, bring you tens of thousands of light years, and then just send you home without a single shred of proof? He said that's how it's been done for billions of years. That's very neat, Doctor. You have no proof, because they didn't want you to have any. A phenomenon known in psychiatric circles, I believe, is a self-reinforcing delusion. Is that what you think, that I was delusional? Well, I do think you may have suffered some kind of an episode. Yes, I do. Dr. Irway, you come to us with no evidence, no record, no artifacts. Only a story that, to put it mildly, strains credibility. Over half a trillion dollars were spent. Dozens of lives were lost. Are you really going to sit there and tell us we should just take this all on faith? Please answer the question, Doctor. Is it possible that it didn't happen? Yes. As a scientist, I must concede that. I must volunteer that. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You admit that you have absolutely no physical evidence to back up your story. Yes. You admit that you very well may have hallucinated this whole thing. Yes. You admit that if you were in our position, you would respond with exactly the same degree of incredulity and skepticism. Then why don't you simply withdraw your testimony and concede that this journey to the center of the galaxy, in fact, never took place? Because I can't. I had an experience. I can't. Proof, I can't even explain it. But everything that I know as a human being, everything that I am tells me that it was real. I was given something wonderful, something that changed me forever. A vision of the universe that tells us undeniably how tiny and insignificant and how rare and precious we all are. A vision that tells us that we belong to something that is greater than ourselves, that we are not, that none of us are alone. I wish I could share that. I wish that everyone, if even for one moment, could feel that awe and humility and that hope. So let's end with a general overview of religious apologetics. There are three broad approaches. You can approach it in a positive manner in which you are attempting to build cases and present well-reasoned defenses of your own view. Negative or polemical apologetics seeks to attack the problems of opposing views or critique other given worldviews. Cultural apologetics takes a different approach, using any source of common ground, for example, science or the arts, film and media, or any aspect of pop culture in general, in order to build bridges and turn any conversation 
into a philosophical dialogue concerning worldview issues and questions of theology. For example, many people stereotype metal as satanic, and many conservatives likewise attacked the pioneer metal group Black Sabbath for its references to the occult and things like this. But did you know that in their song After Forever, Ozzy Osbourne wrote the lyrics, Could it be you're afraid of what your friends might say if they knew you believed in God above? They should realize before they criticize that God is the only way to love. This certainly begs to serve as a launch pad into a philosophical dialogue. Religious apologetics typically digs at the seven criteria for the reasonableness of a belief system. This includes logical consistency. A belief system must avoid contradiction. It's worth pointing out here that paradox is not necessarily contradiction. It must display unity. There must be consistency between the various claims and doctrines. Empirical adequacy. Wherever it is testable, a belief system must verify its trueness. Wherein a teaching defies scientific proof, it is not necessarily illogical, but supranatural. So something that does not fit with the nature of science, since science investigates the physical and spiritual things often refer to the non-physical, this may not necessarily entail the illogical. However, we will need to bear that in mind as we continue to look at the other evidence within the cumulative case. Next, a worldview should demonstrate rational coherence. That is, the philosophical and the practical must coincide. The ethics should match the doctrine. Practical relevance refers to the idea that belief systems must meet human needs. The question of God should offer a satisfactory answer to the questions of human meaning and purpose and destiny. A worldview should be universally relevant. That is, it should be relevant to all people in any situation everywhere in the world. If your view of the world only really applies to your community or your culture or your country, then how can you really say that that is the view that explains the way the world is? And finally, a worldview should offer explanatory power. That is, a belief system must offer satisfactory answers to the major questions of life. Cultural issues that can hinder or complicate dialogue include the general hesitance concerning confrontation. You know, a lot of people just aren't comfortable for different reasons talking about uh, the grounding for their religious views. Also, victimization, the idea that my problems are caused by other people. If someone has a chip on their shoulder against organized religion, or if they think that religion just amounts to a power play that marginalizes minority perspectives on value or ethics, well, it's going to prove difficult to speak with someone of that perspective about the nature of God or the arguments for the existence of God or things like this. Syncretism is also a challenge, especially in the West, especially in the U.S., where we approach many aspects of religion in the same way that we approach our food, like a buffet. So I'll take a little bit of Hinduism, and I like this part of Buddhism, but I don't want all that. I like the teachings of Jesus, but I don't want that talk of sin. And so syncretism is the picking and choosing and combining of different perspectives. Well, the difficulty in speaking with someone like that about philosophy of religion is that they hold so many views, they don't really actually know what they believe. And so when you begin to talk about what they believe, or you begin to talk about certain concepts, they've just got a bunch of concepts together that they don't really know how they fit. And so you can spend a lot of time going round and round and never really making any progress. You really have to know the terms that you're talking about. When you speak of God, what kind of God are you talking about? When you speak of the nature of humanity, what exactly do you mean? When you speak of eternity and the afterlife, 
how exactly do you envision that? You really have to know for sure what you believe about those things in order to dialogue about them. If you hold just a plethora of views that you've kind of squished together, it's hard to cover much ground. And of course, there is the problem of relativism. If someone believes that we can all have our own truths, and either that there is no ultimate truth, but whatever you believe will work for you, and what I believe will work for me, or else there is an ultimate truth, God, but he's not particular about the path to get to him as long as you're kind of religious. And so whatever you believe religiously or spiritually, that will get you to him. Or there's a popular spiritualism amidst the 20th and 21st century that you can just find a meaningfulness by being spiritual, whatever that means. It's really ambiguous. And as we saw, Schaefer would probably say that your theism is showing because you're seeking that spiritual significance you were made to crave. And this is where I leave you. Next week, we begin to build our case for the existence of God, beginning with a defense of truth, even truth as exclusive, and the possibility of miracles.